Please note that all episodes come with a blanket content warning. The books we read often tackle difficult and triggering subjects. We'll include specific content warnings in the description of each episode, so please take care of yourself and check them out. And finally, if you're not comfortable with swearing, now is probably a good time to stop listening. Hi and welcome to Hectic and Eclectic, the podcast for readers whose brains are hectic and whose bookshelves are eclectic. I'm Fia and I'm Hope. <laughs> you okay? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm good. How are you? I'm all right. Good, good. What have you been up to? Um, I started my new job. Oh my God, yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is this is partly why we took a little hiatus, mm-hmm. um, a little mid-season hiatus, a um, little break. Um, because I was starting my new job and I needed all of my spoons for that. Um, but it's really good. It's going really well. It's really fun. It yeah. is chaotic. Mm-hmm. Sounds it. Yeah, but good. And I will say no more than that. So. Great. Okay. <laughs> um, we've seen some fun movies. Oh, yeah, we have. We actually. saw um, Lisa Frankenstein, mm. which I think was the better of the two. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, not last night, the night before, we saw Drive Away Dolls. Drive Away Dolls. Dolls. Is that what it was called? Yeah. Um, which was also super fun. Um, I don't think it topped Lisa Frankenstein, though. Yeah, that was good fun. Um, was. So this week, we're going to be talking about Hope's read a nonfiction. I've read a science fiction. Um, so should we get a crack in? Yeah. Do you want to go first? No. Do you want me to go first? Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, so I have read What We Don't Talk About When We Talk About Fat by Aubrey Gordon. Um, we did talk about this in a previous episode somewhere because we went to see a pre-screening of the documentary film, mm-hmm. um, which is just called Your Fat Friend. I believe, Mm -hmm. because that's the Instagram account that Aubrey Gordon runs and it's about her and her account and how it came to be um, and how we as a society view and talk about and treat fat people. Um, This is really, really interesting. Um, You've tabbed the shit out of it. I have tabbed the shit out of it. Um, I don't know how well you'll be able to see. I don't know if it's going to auto-focus onto it, but I have tabbed it. I went through two whole highlighters. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I started and ran out two highlighters while two? reading this book. Two. They weren't the same colour, were they? They weren't the same colour, which they was were very upset about that. Fucking head in. <laughs> really annoyed me. Yeah. Absolutely drawn um, So I started with this like peachy um, orange colour. Um, and then I had to transition to yellow about oh, halfway no. through. And it really, really upset me. Um, but it is what it is. And yeah, I've tabbed it. Um, so again, I usually, I go for four different colors of tabs. Um, so this time my tabs are quotes and then facts, figures and studies, personal experiences and useful information. Do you ever get like a little boner over um, like a good spreadsheet? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I just got a little boner over... The organisation levels of the categories there. <laughs> just, just a, just a little baby boner. Just a little, um, just a little tiny one. You've lost my page. I've lost your page. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I just really felt like everyone needed to share my boner over that. Great. Um, yeah, I like to have a little key. It's, it's really great. I really need to get some tabs because it looks extremely satisfying. Okay. And actually, I've been like an absolute animal dog earing my books. I don't mind dog earring. Do you like, know? I highlight, I underline, I write little notes in the mm. margins, stuff like that. I think, like, if I was to, obviously, if I was to spill, I was going to say if I was to spill a drink on a book, if I was to spill red wine on a book, that would obviously have to go in the bin. But if I spilled sure. water on it and I was able to dry it out, you know that you get that, like, dry page crinkle mm. kind of thing. I don't think that makes a book need to be thrown out. Like, dog earring. Oh, my God, no. Highlighting, writing quotes, having it. For me, it all gives the book life. Yeah. Gives it character. Same. So I will read the synopsis of this. It is quite long, um, so bear with me. We're constantly talking about fat, risk factors, obesity epidemics, weight loss makeovers, 
In our collective imagination, fat is a terrible thing to be called or an even worse thing to be. But despite insidious concern about fatness, we rarely ask fat people about their lives. To be fat is considered far more than a health concern. For many, to be fat is to be denied doctor's services, to be mocked on airplanes, to be the punchline of jokes, to be a regulated health risk, to be a whisper between friends, to be made more visible and invisible at the same time. It's to be seen as an undeniable failure, as unlovable, unforgivable and morally condemnable. To be fat is to be denied humanity. And what we don't talk about when we talk about fat, Aubrey Gordon, creator of Your Fat Friend, unearths the cultural attitudes and social systems that have led to people being denied basic needs because they're fat. From the racist history of the BMI index to the war on fat people under the veil of an epidemic to fat calling, Gordon pushes the discussion beyond self-love and towards authentic fat activism, which includes ending legal weight discrimination, giving equal access to healthcare for large people, increased access to public spaces and ending anti-fat violence. Between the constant drumbeat of health risks and the rise of body positivity's individualised love your body acceptance, there is a wide world of fat people's social realities that are left out of the narrative Paradigm shifting, this explosive indictment of the systemic and cultural bias facing plus size people calls on all of us to create a tectonic shift in the way we see, talk about, and treat our bodies fat and thin alike. I'm excited about this. It was fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Everyone needs to read it. Fat, thin, mid sized, I don't care. Read this fucking book. Mm. Um, like I say, I went through two highlighters because I just, I just felt felt the need to highlight everything um it was so hard and <laughs> obviously like we've mentioned that I tabbed it there was a point where I had to start being like conservative with my tabs because I was like <laughs> I'm running out of certain colors because I was just tabbing after tabbing after tabbing and it's ridiculous but to me that's the sign of a good non-fiction book mm-hmm. that it's clearly giving me so much information that I like I want to underline it I want to highlight it I want I want like I'm like I want yes I want to remember this or this is super important everyone needs to read this everyone needs to know this or you know this is a fact that I didn't know before that's really interesting that to me is a sign of a really good nonfiction mm. book when I go through a highlighter <laughs> or two yes yeah. that's the case maybe and loads of shit shitloads of tabs is there anything that shocked you that you read there were things I didn't know mm-hmm. for sure um but I don't think there was anything that shocked me okay um but I'm almost disappointed in that oh. because not because of the book, not because I'm like, oh, I wish you'd included some more like shocking things, mm. but because I realized that like this stuff should shock me, but it doesn't. Oh, that's and that's the depressing. worst feeling because, you know, I'm not fat. I'm not large fat, but I'm not thin either. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's a lot of, these ex- the experiences that Aubrey Gordon talks about that I haven't um, experienced and there's a lot that I have mm. um and so because I have had some of those experiences I am acutely aware of them and then that's also made me acutely aware of what larger fat people sort of deal with mm. um in this country and especially in the US Jesus yeah um Aubrey Gordon's American isn't she yes yeah um and so none of it shocked me which is yeah like you say it's kind of gutting yeah that is a thing yeah is there anything from the book that um has like really stuck in your mind is there like one big takeaway that you have from it um the one so what I really liked about this is that it combined um facts figures research studies with people's personal experiences oh, that sounds not, nice yeah not just Aubrey Gordon's but other people's that she spoke to as well and we were saying in that episode where we talked about nonfiction that that um that narrative voice mm. I think that makes it she does it really well in that sense mm. that she's like here's an experience and here's the research to to back that up or right um and and so she does it really well one thing that really stuck with me was when she's talking about um medical side of things and this is not just you know um, fat people are unhealthy Mm. not that kind of medical side of things but the medical care side of things Mm. and that fat people don't get the medical care that thin people get right um because so many times you go to the doctors with um 
symptom A, B, and C, and they'll just attribute it to your weight. And they'll just, their prescription. Which is so lazy. Is, right. Their prescription is just lose weight. Um, and there's so many stories in here of, of people nearly dying because things have gone undiagnosed. Oh there was my God. Um, a woman who was, is, overweight she was coughing up blood and all of this stuff oh she couldn't my breathe God. properly so she went to her doctors um and they basically turned around to her and said well it's because you're fat you need to lose weight and she was like well i've never had a problem with this before so explain to me mm-hmm. why there's suddenly a problem and the doctor was like i don't know what to tell you lose weight um wow. and then five years went by and her health deteriorated and so eventually she saw someone and they found a tumor um where and in her lungs um and they were like right and eventually the outcome of this was that she lost her lung is she still alive yeah i didn't know you could have one lung and still be alive i didn't oh my god so this is what happens when medical practitioners treat fat people like a monolith Mm -hmm. and don't treat their symptoms they just immediately attribute it to them being fat it's killing people. Yeah, absolutely. It could have killed this person. Yeah, and this, um, the person sort of eventually uh, dealt with her healthcare. Basically, said if they'd have picked this up five years ago, you'd still have a lung. And it's just, it's it's unreal. Um, the um, that is shocking. The U.S. laws really shocking. protect it. Being um, overweight isn't a protected character characteristic. Your size isn't a protected characteristic. Mm. So it's perfectly legal for businesses, housing. Like it's perfectly legal to be denied a table at a restaurant, denied a room in a hotel, um, fired. Like so many things based on size. being fat. Yeah. Why would you fire someone for being fat? Why would Why would you do any of that stuff? Yeah. I mean, oh God. there was um, a case of two cocktail waitresses that were fired for putting on weight, um, and oh my God. they tried to take the company to court. Um, well, they did take the company to court and the court ruled in favour of the um, company saying they were perfectly um, within their right to fire them because it's not, you, you just, you can, the laws don't protect it at all. God, that um, is wild. Yeah, it's mad. Um, and Aubrey Gordon herself tells a story about how she went to urgent care and she had her blood pressure taken. And so they put the cuff on and they pump it up and they look take the reading and they usually do it three times and take like best of three mm. generally mm-hmm. at least they do here um and she said the the nurse who was doing it was like really nice really like you know chatty and all of those things she didn't feel like any sort of vibe off her like she could she speaks about she does off some doctors mm. um but this woman taking her blood pressure looked really confused and she like did it three times and then she was like oh i'm just gonna go and get another reader and so, you know, she starts panicking, thinking, what's wrong with my blood pressure? I've oh never had God. a problem with blood, blood pressure before. And so she comes back and she puts it on and Aubrey Gordon goes, what, what's the problem? And the nurse goes, I'm just, I'm, I'm not getting a good reading. And she goes, oh my God, what, what's wrong? And she goes, no, no, nothing wrong. Nothing's wrong. It's coming back perfect. And Aubrey Gordon like panics and she's like, what? So why do you look so confused and concerned? And she was like, but well, that can't be right obese people don't have good blood pressure honestly (laughs) honestly medical institutions have so much to answer for with this sort of stuff because i I think like i was saying to you earlier when we were we were talking about it with bean as well um that like it feels like medical practitioners should be at the forefront of putting all this research into practice now and they're just we we used to think or or like the best we knew was the BMI. The best we knew was exercise, um, less calories, right? So that was the best we knew, but we know more now. We're better now. And it's not being implemented. (laughs) Why is it not being implemented? There's a whole chapter about the the BMI and the history of the BMI and where it came from. Mm. Um, And again, it's just like, what? It's sinister as fuck. Can you explain a little bit? Yeah, so um, it was developed in the 1830s. It's a long ass time ago. 1830s and we're still using it. <laughs> like even if um, not, nothing else about the history um, was even considered, people were smaller. People were... People were tiny. Yeah, people were genetically yeah. smaller. In that, That's why in like, when you go to somewhere in Cornwall and you see a cottage, the door is tiny and you will bang your Dead head low. in it. Yeah. Yeah. Because people, people weren't were as tall. tall. 
we didn't have as much nutrition no no it's mad um and it was um, i can't remember his name but it was some kind of belgian socialist um and he developed the bmi as a way to try and find out what the average man was so he gathered data on a whole bunch of white belgian men in the 1800s um <laughs> in order are, of course the default for right. humanity yes yeah of course. white belgian men yes yeah, yeah um in order to categorize what an idealized average man looked like <laughs> and so he created these categories um and then someone took those categories and fucking ran with them <laughs> And was like, that sounds like a great way of categorizing everyone's weight. Let's fucking do it. And so we just took that and we were just like, yeah, sounds good. And we've just not, good we've, enough. Not, we've not done anything with it since. In fact, that's a lie. We have done something with it since. Plot twist. So in the 1990s, I want to say 1998. Okay. Um, specifically. Um, BMI categories were changed. Okay. So um, there was a headline in the US mm -hmm. said something, the headline was something along the lines of millions of Americans became fat on Wednesday, even if you didn't gain a pound. Right. Okay. Because the categories changed. Okay. So now <laughs> people who were previously got on Tuesday, they were considered a normal weight and then the categories changed and mm. now you were considered overweight. Right. So the categories aren't even what they were. Mm -hmm. So even if you thought you were a normal weight, mm -hmm. you're now not. Going by the BMI, yeah. Yeah, right. but you haven't gained or lost anything. Okay, um, great. And, <laughs> yeah, it was a whole thing. Mm -hmm. Many accurate. Um, yeah, and then a couple of years later, um, a celebrity dietitian like, waged war on obesity, declared it an epidemic, and never once cited that the BMI categories had moved. Um, and it led to loads of things. People that were um, previously considered underweight and anorexic were now considered a normal weight. Um, oh. So they weren't getting the treatment that they needed. Oh, shit. Um, and this is why fat phobia affects everyone. Right. To take um, something that was used to categorise white men in the 1800s don't forget belgian very important belgian men very important um and use it to categorize everybody and aubrey gordon talks specifically about women of color mm. um it is not applicable na cannot be used <laughs> and yet we still use it and that's led to an overestimation of black women um being thought of as overweight mm. when that's simply not the case yeah um you know genetics play a massive part in our size and our body fat distribution and all of those things and you're trying to <laughs> you're trying to apply this system to someone that it was never designed for and so it's got a huge racist history a huge misogynistic history um, and it's it, the bottom line is it's simply not useful. Yeah. It's not a useful way of categorizing people, and yet we use it for everything. Yeah. You know, people are denied surgeries. Trans people are denied surgeries because their BMI is too high. Oh my god! Um, I didn't know and that. Yeah, they'll be told like you need to lose weight before you can get this surgery, especially in the US. If you want to go through fertility treatment in this country, you have mm. to have a BMI under a certain really a certain thing yeah it's mad it just it informs so much in america it informs health insurance it affects every area of your life oh my god wow you know like we we're saying it affects thin people too if you were considered underweight and you're now considered a normal weight mm. you now can't get the treatment that you need for that eating disorder yeah yeah madness it's really funny madness. um my my partner who we're calling beard um is um i think he's like one one point between being considered overweight and like right on yeah. within within the acceptable rate for his BMI. Mm -hmm. And he's just like, that's fucking bullshit. If I put on like one point, however it's measured, I don't know if it's pounds or, or what, yeah. if I put on one more pound, I'm not suddenly overweight yeah, it's and not therefore make any unhealthy. difference to his body. 
Nothing at all. No, you wouldn't see that. No, you wouldn't see it. He wouldn't feel it. No, it would. It would make no material difference. Mm-hmm. Not, not a fucking job. No. Nope. Hmm. Um. You gave you gave us a statistic earlier from the book when we were talking about it, um, which was um eighty percent of eighty percent of your size is determined by your genetics. I just want that to sink in for everyone listening. Eighty mm-hmm. percent of your size is determined by genetics. You have twenty percent room to, to alter try that. and alter it. Yeah. Twenty percent. That's that's pretty losing odds. Yeah. Absolutely. That is pretty yeah. losing odds. It goes a little bit like further into it and it basically says that um up to now, and I, I actually think it was up to 2016, so this was published in 2020 mm-hmm. um, So up to 2016, scientists have discovered 25 genes that contribute to size and weight. Um, and if one, they were so powerful that if one mutated, you were pretty much guaranteed to be obese. And, like, can't do anything about it? No. For the pretty, rest of your life? Pretty much not. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it did studies on things like twins and adopted children, um, specifically adopted children um invariably ended up with body sizes like their birth parents despite their eating habits being informed by their adopted family that is how powerful Mm -hmm. genetics are yeah that's wild when i when i like actually let myself sort of picture that yeah like imagine you have never met your birth parents ever and you end up looking and being made up just like them, mm-hmm. no matter what their eating habits are, no matter what their exercise habits are, yeah. no matter what your um, foster or you know care a family does, that is crazy. Yeah, I've never thought also, about that. I can't imagine how frustrating. Mm. Aubrey Gordon talks a lot about how like, she she eats more than five portions of fruit and veg a day. She loves fruit. She loves veg. She mm. eats organic. She's tried every diet under the sun. She keeps a nutrition, a daily nutrition diary and a daily exercise diary. She moves. She's like, I care about my health. I don't smoke. I don't mm. drink. I don't do drugs. All of this stuff. And she's still considered... Can I just say how... Roughly obese. How fucking miserable does that sound? Right. Like having to be so obsessive about it to prove to medical practitioners or just people calling you fat on the street that you're trying. But the worst bit is that she, um, so she talks about how she was in a doctor's office and that they would ask her about her health and she would tell them, she was like, I eat organic, I eat veg, I, I, I don't have takeaway. I very, very rarely have takeaways. I cook my meals at home, mm. I meal prep, all of this stuff. And they look at her in utter disbelief. They don't believe her. It's just so frustrating. It's so <laughs> frustrating. I do feel like, it's it's good that fat phobia and um you know like body discrimination is becoming a lot more we're, like we're talking about it a lot yeah. more it is good but we've got so fucking far to go yeah. we're not talking the, the reality is we're not talking about it enough yeah um and not the right people and, are talking yeah. about it yeah. like if we could get medical practitioners and dietitians and all these researchers together and actually make some yeah. sort of material change yeah. great but the nhs is still there going you need to lose weight mm-hmm. It's like, I came in about my periods. Yeah. Like, what the fuck has I got to do yeah. with this? Also, if only fat people are talking about it, mm-hmm. that doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. It's thin people need to be talking about it. We need to acknowledge that thin privilege exists. And it's and not that anyone ever asked for that. It is a lottery. It is yeah. just a lottery. It is total chance. And it's not saying that anyone is bad for having yeah. it. It's not your fault. Um, No one's being a dick (laughs) it's just that um like we need you on board yeah it's the same way we need we need white people to be talking about racism you know we need men to be talking about misogyny exactly we need thin people to be talking about fat phobia and it's not being talked about enough so much of the time people just don't realize that it is such a big thing for so many people and so it just sort of gets pushed to the wayside yeah um and yeah it, it it needs to it needs to join that conversation with all those issues that were definitely um which is super overwhelming and super shit that (laughs) really is all of these things that we all need to be considering and talking about and Mm. and making sure that we're aware of and all of that stuff but yeah we it it needs to be done it needs to be added definitely Uh, there's something like i always kind of say that i'm so sorry that anyone else has been through like the kind of discrimination that I've been through. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I'm glad I'm not the only one. Yeah. It makes me feel less alone. And I think if like, uh, 
all marginalized communities could just come together and go, we give a shit yeah. about you as well as us. Like, let's band together. Yeah. I really think it would make life a lot easier. Yeah, it was a lot. It took a lot of spoons. Mm. Um, that's why it's it's pretty much taken me the whole two weeks to read it. Mm. Not because it's long. It's something like 170 pages. It's not long at all. Mm. But it's very information dense and it's it's hard to take in. Yeah. Um, and obviously highlighting and tabbing takes its time Mm -hmm. um but yeah everyone needs to fucking read it um what i will say is it wasn't easy to get hold of Um, oh yeah you talked about this last time i don't suggest trying to get it high street waterstones the works wh smith i don't suggest trying to get it from anywhere like that get it online Mm -hmm. um because it's american i think it is only published in america which i think is why it's hard to get hold of Mm. um barnes and noble is always going to be your best bet Ah, uh, okay. Um, or, unfortunately, the dreaded Amazon. Yeah. Um, I found out recently that Goodreads is owned by Amazon. Yeah. Do you know that? I did. But, which is why you should use Storygraph, because it's women of colour owned. <gasps> Didn't know that. I fucking love Storygraph. Yeah, it's great. It is great. What is your relationship to the word fat? I consider myself fat, but on the smaller side of fat. Uh-huh. Um, I can buy clothing in high street shops, mm-hmm. which is something that again Aubrey Gordon talks about. You'll she she basically says like you'll know when you're on the larger side of fat because you'll stop being able to shop on the high street. Yeah, the alternative to plus size she calls straight size. So I'm going to use those. Okay. So straight size is anything you can get in a high street shop. Okay. Plus size is you know to the where you're struggling to yeah. find yeah or the you, right size. You solely can shop online. Got it. Okay. Um, So I can find my size in shops. Mm -hmm. I can buy clothes on the high street, Mm -hmm. but I do struggle. Mm -hmm. Um, There are clothes that I go, oh my God, I love that. And then it's not in my size. I hate that. Um, High street sizes, more often than not, I'm between sizes. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I really struggle. My stuff, all all of my clothes is either ever so slightly too small Mm -hmm. or ever so slightly too big (laughs) Um, and it's a fucking nightmare yeah um i'm never the same size um between items and i'm never the same size between shops Mm -hmm. um i've got two pairs of jeans from primark one of them's a 20 and is too small for me and one of them is a 16 and it's slightly too big make it make sense make women's sizing makes sense this is the point right they don't make sense there are it's just an arbitrary number yes, that makes no sense that someone's just gone ah oh, that's that and that's that and they'll deal with it yeah um and i i don't go clothes shopping it's very rare i go clothes shopping and i used to when i was you know um between sort of 13 and 18 mm-hmm. i would go i'd love going clothes shopping mm-hmm. i'd spend hundreds of pounds in primark and i'd come home with all these new clothes and i'd try them on and i'd like a fashion show for my boyfriend at the time or whatever um and now the only reason i go clothes shopping is because i need something specific mm-hmm. like i or i need something to wear for a job interview or okay. i need a new pair of gym leggings or whatever mm-hmm. um and i always come home in tears always i oh. never go clothes shopping and don't come home upset deflated hating my body oh. like i don't want to ever look in a mirror again kind of mood oh yeah um yeah I have this conversation with Bean quite often because he will sit there and he'll tell me, you're, you're, you're beautiful. I love your body. Mm. You know, I, I don't want anything that isn't this. Yeah. Um, and he's like, what's it going to take for you to believe that? Uh, okay. Um, and, you know, we've had this conversation a lot of times where I'll, I've sat in front of him and I've said, I've never, ever, ever not believed myself to be fat. Um, and I, when I look back on my teenage years and pictures of me as a teenager, I can look back and see and know that now I have the language for that, which was body dysmorphia. Um, and I look back and I'm like, I was skinny. Mm. I was thin. I mean, I've shown you a picture of at my brother's wedding mm. um, where obviously I'll now look back and I'm like, I, okay, I definitely had an eating disorder. Yeah. Um, you can see my collarbones, like my neck is like dead thin. And then because I've got quite a weird shaped and quite a large head, especially on my forehead, (laughs) um, I look like a bobblehead because my neck's so thin (laughs) and my collarbones are so like 
inward and mm. I, I just I was there was points where I was thin there was points where I was skinny there was points where I was unhealthy but even at those points I thought I was fat yeah I don't think I've ever suffered with body dysmorphia so is it that at the time you were looking in the mirror could you see your collarbones could you see how thin your no. neck was you couldn't no. see it no I would look in I would genuinely body dysmorphia is so um it's, it's impossible to explain to someone who mm. who doesn't see it and there's um you'd have to search it up but I remember it's probably on YouTube somewhere I remember a video um of a woman with anorexia and they gave her um a piece of paper and a pen and they said draw yourself and she literally she drew like a circle and then put like a head on it and arms and legs wow. like this is how people see themselves I imagine it's like you know when you go into like a fun house or at like a fair, right the mirrors like the mirrors that make you exactly. look like you're enormous that is exactly that's what, what it it's like yeah that sounds so scary and disorientating yeah it is and I can't I can't imagine it's, it's, what that is like. It's 24/7. so hard to, to get your head around. And people would take pictures of me and be like, look, like, and in, mm. a, in a picture, mm. I can, you, you can see. You can see it. Right. Ah. Um, but in the mirror, it's, it's, it's like you say, it's like the mirror's like curved. Or yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and so you, I would have that moment where someone would show me a picture and I would be like, oh, yeah, I can sort of see what you're saying. But then mm. I would go home and look in the mirror and then it, it, and it just didn't gone. match up. Yeah. And so in, in my head, I was like, I, the only reality I have is my own. And so if what I'm looking at and what I'm seeing, that's all I have to believe. That's all I have to go off. Mm. And if all I see is this, is this big person, you know, that's, that's all I have to go off. Um, and you know, my, my mum didn't help. She was, um, she would comment on my body growing up and, mm. and, and all of that stuff. Okay. But yeah, it was always, you know, oh, boys won't want you if you do this and, oh, you've put a bit of weight on, maybe we should go on diet and all of this stuff. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I'm now, I'm trying to hold the thought of, okay, I'm fat in my brain mm -hmm. and be okay with it oh. rather than to remove the thought of no I'm not fat I want to hold it there and I want to be okay with it because being fat is not the worst thing a person can be mm -hmm. I think I'm you know I, I have moments where you know I don't like myself or I think I'm this and I think I'm that but Ultimately, if I take a step back, I think I'm a nice person. I think I'm an intelligent person. You know, all of these things. And I would rather be all those things than be skinny. Yeah. I hold all those things in higher esteem than to be fat. To be fat is not the worst thing a person can be. Mm. As long as I'm intelligent and bettering myself and, and um, I'm kind, then I'm okay with being fat. Hmm. I'm proud of you. Uh -huh. <laughs> Your turn. Okay, my turn. All right. So I had the opposite childhood mm -hmm. from my mum. And I know she'll listen to this. And I really hope that she doesn't spiral. <laughs> <laughs> because um, she did the absolute best with what she knew. Mm -hmm. um, so when it came to my body, she praised it always praised it um but she would also compare mm -hmm. herself to my body as I grew up but when I was really really young I remember I have a really strong core memory of um being in her bedroom in our current house in or my parents current house which is in Somerset so I must have been over the age of nine mm -hmm. by this point and I remember her she was just like getting changed in front of me we were just chatting and I somehow the the conversation turned to her body and um and she called herself fat and she used the word like it was a synonym for ugly or bad yeah and like I could hear the venom in it um and so I said, you're not fat because I was hearing the synonym, you know? Yeah. 
Um, and she went, I, no, I am, darling. Like, don't don't be stupid kind of thing. And that was, it really upset me mm. because it's it's not, it wasn't about her calling herself fat. Like you say, it's not inherently a bad word yeah. or a bad thing to be. It was the venom and the disgust yeah. in her voice yeah. about her body and about herself. One of the things that Aubrey Gordon talks about about when she was growing up was that she was always called fat as a kid and mm. she was never offended by it until she learned that she was supposed to be. And I was Ooh. like, oh! <laughs> That's that, like, interesting. That, that cut... That, that caught me a little bit and I was like oh okay that's really interesting it's like I never learned that because I when I was growing up I had I still have a lot of like thick dark body hair mm. and so like I had a moustache I had a mono brow and it was all very very visible mm. and it was never a negative thing in my perspective until someone else made me feel like yeah. it was ever yeah I wouldn't have given a shit otherwise right because like unless someone teaches you something is bad you don't think it is yeah um so yeah I guess with like um when it came to my relationship with my mum and her relationship with her body yeah it was like she it was almost like she was trying to teach me to hate her body as well yeah or to be disgusted by her body as well and I don't think she would have been cognizant of any of that yeah if she no, was she wouldn't not. have done it yes yeah. um but it's really interesting because like she would as i as i was growing up we would we would talk about our bodies together and and she was also a midwife so she was very very open with me about sex about hormones about periods about puberty everything yeah. which i am so grateful for as she should be because i've heard stories from like other um like female bodied people i know mm-hmm. um who started their periods and, no and thought they were dying yeah. because their mum or dad or no one had ever told mm. them it was a thing yeah literally thought they were going to die like how fucking traumatic yeah can you imagine that, that kind of shit stays with you like when yeah. when when you know mum comes along and says no you're fine that doesn't make that trauma go away like that's happened yeah that's stuck yeah. now yeah there is forever going to be that negative association yeah. with your first period um but yeah so I I loved all that that openness that we had about our bodies it was really really nice but um she would sort of go oh you're so lucky you can just eat whatever you want when you get to my age or or when you get to 30 it's going to catch up to you like it like it was this like looming threat (laughs) um of your body's going to become unacceptable Mm -hmm. if you keep doing a b and c and I actually kind of like I, I think part of like the rebellion I had as a teenager was like um deciding to be like oh well, yeah fuck it i'm gonna eat whatever the fuck i want and i'm gonna be because proud of it because i can yeah and i'm gonna be proud of it yeah. and um and i would eat i would shovel shovel down food shovel it shovel it shovel it and i would get this encouragement from my mum where it would be like good on you girl kind of thing yeah eat what you want <laughs> while you still can yeah but while you still can like this lubing threat yeah. um which is really interesting and now my kind of my relationship with with food and my body and having put on weight and being fat I do see myself as fat but I think because I'm also tall I don't think I like say like me and someone else who was shorter than me we could be the same clothing size yeah but a shorter person will look fatter than me Because, because the weight's not distributed as well. Exactly. So I, I kind of flip back and forth between feeling that I am fat and I can describe myself that way and feeling like, oh, I'm just curvy and I've got a massive tummy. Do you know? Like, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. But I have what I have noticed the most about gaining weight, and it happened during lockdown, it was like I, I stopped exercising. My, my mental health was just horrendous. I was so scared to go outside. Um, I couldn't bring myself to have an exercise routine. I was um, just sort of binge eating quite a lot. Which is the reality for so many people. Exactly. Like very, very relatable. Um, But I started to see how um, putting weight on rapidly affected how um, men paid attention to me in the street. And I used to get a lot more sexual harassment from men in the street than I do now. I, mm-hmm. I very rarely am sexually harassed now, um, which kind of makes me feel positively about having put on weight because yeah. in a way it keeps me safe. Mm. 
and which is fucking awful yeah it's it's a fucking depressing thing to say like that is that is tragic yeah tragic yeah. like I both know. embarrassing and the actual you know root of the word tragic yeah yeah it's yeah it's an awful thing to have mm. to it's 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 that like double-ended dildo <laughs> The double-ended dildo of fat phobia. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, Do you mean double-edged sword? Yes. You're welcome. Yeah, there's a chapter in here um, called The Desirability Myth, which talks about um, how Ooh. we as a society conflate fat with ugly. Yeah. Or with undesirable. Yeah. Um, and that's so not the case. And, you know, we'll have all seen um, the the person on Instagram um, years ago that did the whole um, I'm fat. No, you're not. You're beautiful. I I've said that so many times. Both. I can be both. Thank you. People, for some reason, think that they can't find fat people attractive, that it's, it's like intrinsically true that fat people aren't attractive, can't be beautiful, can't be handsome. And it's, it's just really narrow minded. And it's just what society tells us. Like, I think everyone needs to reflect on that. We need to actually reflect on what has been fed to us by societal Eurocentric beauty standards yeah. and see if actually that's true for us. Mm -hmm. Is that actually what we think? Or has that just been, you know, insidiously shown to us all our lives? So yeah. we just default believe it now. Yeah. The takeaways from this are don't comment on your children's bodies. Mm. Don't comment on your body around your children. And the second takeaway is read this fucking book. I can't wait to read this book. I don't think we've ever had an episode where I haven't said that, but I'm going to continue saying it because it's always true. Great. I'm going to make a compilation of all the times you've said, I can't fucking wait to read this book. <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> okay. Uh, are you ready for some sci-fi? Yes. Okay. All right, so this is In Ascension by Martin McInnes. Um, and I'll read you the blurb before I go on to um, talk about it. Um, so Lee grew up in Rotterdam, drawn to the waterfront as an escape from her unhappy home life and volatile father. Enchanted by the undersea world of her childhood, she excels in marine biology, travelling the globe to study ancient organisms. When a trench is discovered in the Atlantic Ocean, Lee joins the exploration team, hoping to find evidence of the Earth's first life forms. What she instead finds calls into question everything we know about our own beginnings. Her discovery leads Lee to the Mojave Desert and an ambitious new space agency. Drawn deeper into the agency's work, she learns that the Atlantic Trench is only one of several related phenomena from across the world, each piece linking up to suggest a pattern beyond human understanding. Lee knows that to continue working with the agency will mean leaving behind her declining mother and her younger sister and faces an impossible choice to remain with her family or to embark on a journey across the breadth of the cosmos. Exploring the natural world with the wonder and reverence we usually reserve for the stars in Ascension is a compassionate, deeply inquisitive epic that reaches outward to confront the greatest questions of existence, looks inward to illuminate the smallest details of the human heart and shows how, no matter how far away we might be and how much hope we, we have lost, we will always attempt to return to the people and places we call home. This book is epic in every possible way. It's epically big. It's big in every possible way. A thick boy. She thick. It's it's just the most enormous story, but it's so grounded by like the minutia of like Lee sort of reflecting on her family, on herself, on her past, on her parents, um, while making all of these insane, life changing earth shattering discoveries mm -hmm. and it is just stunning it is a masterpiece um i'm gonna read you a little bit from it i think like the wonder in this book is just so infectious like it's like that meme from it's always sunny in philadelphia where the guy's got like 
all of these things pinned up and like red thread connecting and all and he's just like not (laughs) blinking like this is how I feel like Lee would be in person if I let her explain something to me that's um that's me talking about the sims (laughs) it really is I want you to know that that meme is me talking about sims law it honestly is yeah that's me if you ever let me talk about plants but you don't so it's fine I don't no yeah so Lee's marine biology degree um leads into a doctorate Mm -hmm. and then she's asked to come aboard um the endeavor which is a ship um that is going towards a trench in the ocean um have you ever heard of the mariana trench yeah yeah so it's really really deep it's like if you can imagine mountains below the ocean and the trench sort of between them going so deep that it's impossible for man or machine to get down there (laughs) the stank face hope is making right now is giving me life um they found a trench that is potentially hundreds of times deeper than the mariana trench which is the deepest one that we know of i'm out (laughs) hope's fully tapped out um so what they do is they go out from from the Endeavour on little boats and they're going to scuba dive and try and collect samples and see what they can find. <laughs> that's, that's a no thank you from Hope. Okay. I swallowed oxygen, tested and flexed limbs, told myself, relax, you've done this a thousand times before. Then something strange happened as everything became easy, generous. I was no longer moving myself. I was carried. My voice became quiet echoing further and further away. A diver's dark silhouette spun slowly down, tumbling until it disappeared. The disappearance calmed me. Everything was perfectly still and quiet. My heart rate dropped. I stopped hearing my breath's repetition. I lost myself into a wide, vast warmth, a wholly enveloping medium. Suddenly the sea was bright with colour as life surged. A purple and yellow sea lily uncrushed itself, pushing away water in a spray. Red-tipped tube worms undulated successively like the drift of a breeze over a wheat field, a thought unfurling across a bed of neurons. Jets of biolite glowed and pulsed as outlines of animals burst in rapturous communication then disappeared again into the darkness. Transparent cephalopods hung suspended in an immensity. Bacterial symbionts drained and nourishing everything. Archaea under it at the heart of it, crawling, synthesising, stretching back, inexpressible return, blinding sunlight. How fucking beautiful is that? I was going to say, two things. Um, A, you're way better at reading aloud than I am. Thank Um, you. I get tongue twisted so easily. Um, And B, that almost made me... I was like, oh, this sounds really like, like you say, beautiful and and so immersive. Yeah, and really just nice. Um, And if I didn't fucking hate the ocean, (laughs) (laughs) it would also make it would almost make me love it. You can feel Um, the joy in the way she's experiencing it, can't you? Yeah. God, I would write that very differently. (laughs) That's so interesting. What would you do? I there are. There are certain words in there that sort of made me think, yeah, I'd probably use that. And then there were certain words that I'm just like, that's not how I would experience that. Uh. Um, you know, you know, you, 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 two people can see the same thing and they would use different adjectives to describe sure. it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and because I hate the ocean so much, um, <laughs> it just, th- those sort of beautiful adjectives of things like flowing mm, and undulating yeah, and things like that just would not be it. I think like you get such an amazing sense of awe yeah. in this book that is just so so immersive and um she she sort of goes from her marine biology takes her from like fucking the bottom of the ocean all the way into space and you get sort of it's the book split into four parts um where her her journey sort of um goes along and um by the end of it she she's in space and it's so interesting because it almost metaphorically almost takes you from one edge of the universe to the other um and that's mm. such a nice sort of path for yeah. a novel to take yeah it is it does feel very physical as well that like the way you use the word path there yeah it definitely feels like that yeah. there's like it's almost like it feels like a predestined kind of journey mm. that she's sort of 
fallen into and she's like she's she's got this amazing drive and ambition behind her because yeah. she wants to answer this question which is where did we come from how did this happen yeah. because um one of the words in there that i read just now was archaea and that basically means like these ancient versions of multicellular life they were the first type of multicellular life yeah. that were born but we do not know how they happened mm. There is no explanation for how these things just ended up to be. Yeah. yeah. So that's what she, you know, the fact that they've, they're potentially looking at finding these archaea in the ocean. Um, they could match up with something else that may be found in space and they're wondering, which is such a big question that plagues humanity at yeah. large, right? Is where did we come from and where do we end up? Religion is sort of touched upon in this actually. Um, so by the time she's on the spacecraft, um she's got two other crewmates and one of them is a christian interesting and he's actually the captain of the mission mm. um so something that they <laughs> they kind of make themselves debate so that they can because they're they're traveling in zero gravity basically the the mission is trying to get them out past the oort cloud have you ever heard of one no basically beyond our solar system great <laughs> Big fan, um, okay. which no no person has ever travelled to. Can we keep it that way? But like, yeah, going back to the minutia of everything as well. But something this book does so beautifully is like the the sort of step by step logical preparation mm. for you know a potentially unknowable amount of time yeah. in zero gravity in mm -hmm. space, um, and how much they would have to train. Like she does like fucking fourteen eighteen hour days strength training because when you're in zero gravity your muscles completely yeah. atrophy you know mm -hmm. how you see like um astronauts um coming out of like a spacecraft in a wheelchair yeah they can't fucking walk yeah they haven't been doing that for weeks months yeah. whatever so yeah like the the rigorousness of um of the explanations of all of it and how um like she's using her marine biology to create um like a, a sustainable food source for them on the ship. Um, it's just so fascinating. That's something I really oh. love. Science fiction is not um, a genre I gravitate towards. Mm. I'm more, I gravitate more towards the fantasy. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing I do love about science fiction is that generally they're so well researched. Oh my God, I learned so much yeah. from this book. And you're, it's, it's, that's when you can read a fiction book and still learn from it mm. that's you've hit peak it's a real sweet spot isn't it yeah um lee as a narrator is so generous she's so honest and she's so reflective about herself and about her past and how having an abusive father has led her to become obsessed with these these things of like how where did we come from like she recognizes the similarities between herself and her father mm. and finds it so hard to reconcile with yeah um and you know getting into marine biology was like a complete escape from like that violent home life that yeah. she was having um and she's she's so like reflective and you get you just get so much from her and then towards the end of the book you hear from her sister and get a totally different perspective yeah and i wouldn't call her I wouldn't call Lee an unreliable narrator for that. Um, but I just found it like really enriching. Like I yeah. felt like I got to know Lee on a different level. Yeah. And I think like. You're just the, seeing her from the outside now. Exactly. Yeah. And I think like there's a level of intimacy with this book um, that I, I just, yeah, I'm in, I'm in awe of. I think that's something you don't normally get with sci-fi as well mm. is that intimacy with the narrator because yeah. the, the focus generally is, is plot driven. Mm rather than character driven mm. and so when you do get um a sci-fi book that can do both yeah um and can really get into those characters and stuff like that it's um i wouldn't say it's rare but it's um it happens less often than a plot driven definitely um, book but that's probably why it's so big yes I w yeah i would have thought so and also like i feel with a lot of bigger books there there's stuff that i would cut if i was the editor yeah. i'd be like cut that whole chapter bye bye yeah don't fucking need it um but with this every moment felt necessary yeah every moment it was delightful it was a gift 
Um, I love you, Martin McInnes. Um, we talk about fiction books and non-fiction books so differently. <laughs> With fiction books, we're like, this is beautiful. The descriptions, the adjectives, <laughs> it's so mm, intimate and rich, beautiful and tasty. you should absolutely read it. And then non-fiction books, we're like, all the information in here is awful. Read it. <laughs> Get depressed. <laughs> so um, true. Yeah. So, so true. Great time. One day we'll read a non-fiction book that we don't get depressed over. Do you want to play a game? I'd love to play a game. Great. Okay. So we're going to play a fill-in-the-blank quotes game. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, God, I'm going to be shit at these. So um, <laughs> they have they have just um, underscores where the blank is, and then they have the answer at the okay. bottom. Okay. So I don't need to know what book it is or who it's written by. I just want the word to fill in the blank. And then I'll tell you what it's from. Okay. 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 Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. So, blank, warm you up from the inside. They also tear you apart. Read me it one more time. Blank, warm you up from the inside. They also tear you apart. Children. (laughs) (laughs) Is that your final answer? Yes. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> hate that the answer is memories oh memories warm you up from the inside but they also tear you apart and this is from kafka on the shore by haruki murakami <gasps> i've never read any murakami and that's because someone once told me that his female characters were shit and um he's a bit of a misogynist great yeah love that yeah but i am intrigued because he's so prolific so- and if you love so him, popular. you don't stop going on about yeah, him. Yeah, I know. And he's got, he's got such a backlist as well. Mm. Mm-hmm. Okay, are you ready? <laughs> yeah. All right. All human wisdom is summed up in these two words, weight and blank. Weight, spell weight? Weight as in like uh, stop, like weight, body pause. Weight. Weight. Mm-hmm. weight and blank. Weight and Wait and go forth. <laughs> so do the opposite of what we just said. Um, okay, you ready? You're going to kick yourself. All human wisdom is summed up in these two words, wait and hope. <laughs> I told you you're going to kick yourself. Who is, what, right, am I going, am I going? That was from The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Interesting. This is a short one. Okay, man. There is always something left to blank. Oh, for fuck's sake. That's so vague. I want to say eat, but I think that's just... <laughs> that would have been my reaction. Right really? <laughs> there is always something left to... Do? Be? I thought do as well. See? What's your final answer? Oh, I don't fucking know. Um, do. <laughs> I ate it. There is always something left to love. This is in 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Gosh, Gosh, Garcia Marquez. Gosh, 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 Gosh. gosh. <laughs> um, so far, I've read none of these books. Do you think you'd get it right even if you had read the book? <laughs> I feel like if if it was a longer first line and there was more context... We do have some first maybe. lines, but we don't have that game with us. Oh, okay, we have famous okay. first lines. Okay, okay. All right, are you ready for yours? Next week. Yes. Ooh, I think you might have read this. Interesting. I think you might have done. I'll get it wrong. Okay. <laughs> Whatever our blank are made of, his and mine are the same. Souls. Damn. Correct. From, do you know? Whatever our souls are made of, his and mine are the same. What a line. That's fit, that. Um, no, I'm not sure what it's from. It's from Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. I was going to say Bronte. Emily Bronte. Um, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I thought you'd get that. Okay, my turn. Um, if you get this wrong, mm-hmm. we can't be friends anymore. Oh, shit. The answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything is blank. Is it cheating if I ask you to tell me what it's from? Yes. But I need context. I'm getting zero context. Okay, tell me it one more time. One more time. The answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything is blank. Your mum. 
The answer is 42. Give me that. Oh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the... I tried to read this, but I hated it when I was about 18. the movie? No, I would have avoided it because I'd tried to read it and I'd hated it. Absolute hate. Have you read it? I've seen the movie. It's shit. The answer to life, the universe and everything (laughs) is 42. Right. And that is from The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams. Well, fuck me very much. (laughs) (laughs) Ha ha. Ha. You're not going to get this. All right. Beware, for I am blank and therefore blank. Beware, for I am autistic and therefore weird. <laughs> um, beware, for I am blank and therefore blank. Beware, for I am um, poor and therefore powerful. Ooh. Beware, for I am fearless and therefore powerful. Ooh. Ooh, that was close. Can you guess what, it, from, what it's from? I knew it was something because... Um, it, I, I got the vibe of the whole um, someone with nothing to lose is a very dangerous person. Mm, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, I got I got that sort of vibe. Ah, yeah, yeah. Um, beware, for I am fearless and therefore powerful. Do you want a clue? Yeah, the mother of sci-fi. Oh, um, is it Ursula Le Guin? No, earlier, much earlier. Merge earlier. Merge earlier. I don't know how much earlier I know, if I'm honest, um, when it comes to sci-fi. Mary Shelley, Frankenstein. Oh, shit. There you go. Let us know how many you got right at home. I'm going to subject you to Would You Rather, because I wrote it specially, <laughs> knowing what we were going to talk about. Okay. Um, and you will enjoy it, or else... Okay. Would you rather... What we don't talk about when we talk about fat slash inascension edition. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Would you rather get really famous being a clean eating slash fad diet influencer <laughs> or be really little known for making an important scientific discovery? Neither. I can literally see your brain ticking. And it's it's like kind of making a dunk kind of noise every um, few seconds. Be really little known for the scientific discovery. Because I the others cause harm to only mm. me, but I don't think I could be responsible for causing harm to others. I'm fully on board with that. Yeah, same here. Okay, would you rather train 14 hours a day to no. prepare for life? <laughs> no, the end. Um, I don't need to know the other option. <laughs> I don't need to know the other option. Right, that's that then. I'll just, I'll just read it to you. Right. Okay, would you rather train 14 hours a day to prepare for life in zero gravity for a year or take Ozempic for six months yeah. and take your chances on whatever the fuck that might do to your body? Yep. R- oh my, okay. Okay, cool. Okay, would you 14 rather... 14 hours a day? Yeah. I don't even think I'm awake for 14 hours a day. I don't think you are either. I'm not. No, can <laughs> confirm they are not. Um, okay, would you rather everyone around you exclaimed, oh my God, you're not fat, uh, <laughs> forever, uh-huh. or have a thirst for discovery that never can be truly satisfied? I think I have that anyway. So I think I live with that generally. Hmm. So that one. That one. Interesting. Okay, cool. All right, two more. Uh, would you rather go on a submarine mission nope. with the mysterious company from Our Wives Under the Sea? Nope. Or go to space with the agency in In Ascension and attempt to travel beyond the Oort Cloud? Oh, neither. <laughs> <laughs> if you had to, gun to your head. Um, she comes back in Our Wives Under the Sea. She's fucked, but she does come back. I'm going to go with that one Mm -hmm. because the space one I might not come back from. Very logical. I like that. Okay. Uh, Would you rather read only sci-fi for the rest of your life or read only science non-fiction for the rest of your life? Read only science non-fiction for the rest of my life. 
Mm. Really? See. Why? Uh, because I, I've always um, categorized myself. I've always hated this phrase, but I've always categorized myself within it is that I've always thought of myself as having a thirst for knowledge. Mm. I always want to know more. And mm. I think I've been like that from birth. I, I was one of those why kids. Um, oh, yeah. I always wanted to know more about things and it's just stayed with me you still are a why kid yeah I am. you you regularly go why why yeah why at me yeah. if you like our show please remember to like rate and subscribe as it will help us reach more hectic bookworms you can find us on instagram at hectic.eclecticpod twitter at the hectic pod and on youtube and spotify as hectic and eclectic podcast one day we'll be able to do that without reading them off. No, we won't. You can send any ideas, suggestions mm. to hectic-eclectic-pod at gmail.com. And if you don't like us, you can shove it up your ass. Bye! Bye.